Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here, and thanks, for, thanks to Wireless Village for having me. <laughs> uh, my name's Eric Ruder. Uh, I'm, I, I'm not sure how to introdu introduce myself to this crowd. My work is not in anything that I'm going to talk about today. I'm a, I teach and um, consult in acoustics and noise control. But my education is electrical engineering, and I've been a lifelong electronics nut and, uh, and train nut. And so I look for ways occasionally to bridge those gaps, although it's, it's rare that those opportunities work out. But with the advent of um, consumer SDR devices in the last five years or so, um, I've been inspired to look at some of the wireless protocols that the railroads use. Um, and my interest in this isn't to find ways to exploit them or break them. It's really to figure out where the trains are so I can go and take pictures of them and things of that nature. I'm part of a, um, a subculture of people who likes to chase trains around and, uh, and photograph them. <laughs> this, is one, this photograph was taken in Apex, which is just a few miles north of here a couple of years ago. Um, I'm a ham, AB1XO, for the hams in the room. And, um, <laughs> and then uh, I'm on Twitter, but I've only ever tweeted four times, and two of them were in the last 48 hours. So um, I will send out some of the material from this after. I am going to release some code um, as well. So if you want to find that stuff, you can follow me. And um, I hope I won't disappoint you. Um, so I, when I put this together and I wrote the abstract, I had planned to sort of break this into three parts. Uh, first, looking at a survey of, of all the different wireless systems that railroads use in the United States, and then look at two specific protocols that I've spent a lot of time reverse engineering for no particular reason except to um, use them as learning tools for uh, learning about SDR and getting radio and Python and RFID and, and things. So um, I decided, though, to spend the time on those two things and not spend much time on the other protocols. But just very quickly, uh, these are kind of the major um, uh, uses of RF that the, that the railroads use. There's um, voice communications. These have been around forever. They got narrow banded a few years ago, but it's, they're all still in the same block of frequencies. Uh, PTC and ATCS are both flow, um, uh, traffic control protocols. PTC's had a lot of press lately. Uh, distributed power, DP, is a remote control protocol for locomotives. And then the two that I want to talk to you about today are the end of train uh, head of train telemetry system, uh, the EOT system, and the automatic equipment identification system, AEI. So I'm going to jump right into uh, the EOT system first. To really understand uh, the purpose of the EOT, I'm going to spend a few slides on mechanical stuff, and that's the, the braking systems for railroads. So if you have a, a locomotive or, or a set of locomotives and then a string of cars, um, you have to have brakes on the independent on the individual cars, or you'll never stop the train. They would easily over, overwhelm the, the locomotives. So, in the early days, this was accomplished by having people run down the top of the train and turn wheels, which is very dangerous and inefficient. You really had to plan ahead if you wanted to stop the train. And um, uh, that went on until uh, the late. 1800s, and just around 1869 or so, George Westinghouse, when he was 22, came up with and patented the first railroad air brake system, which is very similar to what's still used. And the important thing to understand about the way these brakes work is that um, they're intended to be fail-safe, which, which is to say that the, uh, the brake cylinders on the cars are actuated by air that's stored on each car. And so to apply the brakes, you actually reduce the pressure that you send to the cars from the engine. And that's important in the context of, of the device that we're going to look at here. This is how it goes together. You have in the engine the, the red stuff there, um, a compressor, a reservoir for air. It's fairly high pressure. And then there's a pipe that runs the whole length of the train and carries the air to 
um, each car, which has a, a special valve called a triple valve, a reservoir, and then the um, brake cylinder and brake shoe, and then that applies to the wheel. So there are, there are three basic conditions that are important in the context of this discussion. The kind of steady state condition is when the brakes are off, the release condition. And during that time, there's about 90 PSI of air being supplied by the engine to the cars. That charges up the reservoirs on the cars. So they're always being charged, sort of topped off. And then if you want to slow down the train, you do what's called a service application, which means that you reduce, gradually reduce the pressure from the engine. The pressure in the reservoir on the car becomes higher than that in the brake pipe, and some of that then moves the valve and bleeds off and applies the brakes. The other condition is called an emergency application. That's when there's a car stuck in the tracks or something, and you need to stop the train right now. And to do that, you vent the brake line to the atmosphere. You dump the air. So instead of reducing it slowly, you reduce it to zero immediately. And that applies the brakes very quickly. <clears throat> the, um, the propagation rates essentially are limited by the speed of sound. So the, the um, service application propagation is about six, six to 700 feet per second. And then an emergency application gets up to about 900 feet per second. But a train can be miles long. So it takes a few seconds, even in an emergency application, to get air all the way to the back of the train, which means that the brakes are on at the front, but not at the back. And the momentum of those cars are still pushing until that propagates to the back. <clears throat> Um, so it's important for the engineer to know what the pressure is at the back of the train uh, for several reasons. When you start moving, you need to know when the brakes are off. You need to know that the brake pipe is intact, that it hasn't pulled apart. And then if you're actually moving in the in knuckle uh, coupler brakes, you want to know that the train hasn't pulled apart. So it's important to monitor that pressure at the back of the train. And for the first 110 years or so, that was done by a human in a caboose. This is one of the principal functions of the caboose, was to monitor the brake pressure. And then in the, about 1980, the caboose was no longer required by the FRA, and they were quickly replaced by these EOT devices, which is uh, in the photo there. So the EOT hangs on a coupler on the back, connects to the brake line, monitors the pressure, and radios the pressure back to the engine. So the, um, the system is a, a two-part, two-way system, full duplex system. It's a frequency pair. And the EOT sends telemetry data forward. And the engine has a couple of commands that it can send back. And I'll get to that in just a second. Um, but it is full duplex. So if you want to hear both of them, you have to monitor both frequencies. <clears throat> so some, some functions. Um, the first one I've talked about. Uh, it also provides a flashing red light on the back of the train, which is required for night operations by the FRA. These are sometimes called FREDs, for flashing rear end device. And in that case, the HOT is called Wilma. Um, and, uh, and then the last function there is that in an emergency stop situation, the HOT, the head unit, which sits in the engine, can tell the EOT to dump the air. And that effectively dumps the air from both ends of the train at once and applies the brakes much more quickly. <clears throat> this is the source of a security concern that we'll talk about here. Specifications, uh, this is the frequency pair I mentioned earlier. The RF power of the EOT is two watts. The antenna is in a terrible position. It's you know, blocked by the bulkhead end of a, of a rail car. Um, so the reception is actually much better any place but the engine. Uh, so it's easy to monitor these things. The um, modulation is a continuous phase fast frequency um, shift keying, also called um, minimum shift keying. And the mark and space frequencies, it's a 1200 baud signal. Mark and space frequencies are 1200 and 8, 1800 hertz. And the way that uh, MSK or FFSK works is that you have one cycle uh, of your, um, uh, each symbol is either one cycle of 
the lower frequency or one and a half cycles of the higher frequency. And the benefit to this is that the phase is continuous. Every time you get to a zero crossing, you don't have a discontinuity. So uh, it doesn't create a lot of um, harmonic noise. So you can use a very narrow transmission channel. For this to work, you have to have uh, either a marker space frequency that equals the baud rate. And so what I've plotted here is a 0101 uh, sequence. And you can see that you have, uh, for the uh, ones, a full cycle of 1,200 hertz. And for the zeros, uh, one and a half cycles of 1,800 hertz. The phase is arbitrary. It's dependent on the previous symbol. So if you look at every other uh, sine wave or every other one, the phase is opposite. So it's, it's the frequency that matters, not the phase. So uh, frequency shift keying of, or fast frequency shift keying of this type is a type of AF, AFSK audio frequency shift keying, which means that it's a sort of two-part modulation demodulation process. So to modulate it, essentially, you take a bit stream and you generate audio. And that audio may never be heard or see the light of day, but it, it becomes an audio signal. And then you can transmit that through an audio channel or a, a channel that's, in, that's um, designed for voice communication. So in the early days of uh, data modems, that, that was the type of uh, transmitter that was available. So you see a lot of this in older protocols like this. And then on the other end, you do the opposite. You can demodulate the audio and then, and then demodulate the bitstream. And I'll show you that process in GNU Radio. All right, so um, this, uh, these telemetry packets have been used for a long time by rail fans, people who like trains, to, um, uh, to tell when a train is coming. You know, if you're out waiting for a train that you want to see, you start to hear these chirps, telemetry chirps. Um, that's how you know there's a train approaching. But I always wondered what they were actually saying. And so that was sort of the, um, the uh, motivation for this project. And uh, there is a Windows software called Soft EOT that does this, but it's not open source. And I really wanted to dig into it and understand it. So the first clue I got was this figure from a patent. And the patent was from some you know, proposed improvement or something that probably didn't go anywhere. But they had this figure in there that has the packet format. So they have up at the top the uh, bit sync and the frame sync and then what's in the actual packet. And so starting with this, I was able to uh, do some additional research and come up with what I think is the packet contents for a modern EOT. This has evolved a bit over the last 40 years as uh, the technology has gotten better. Um, the important things here, though, are the unit ID and the pressure. And then there are some other flags for things like battery condition, uh, whether the rear end light is flashing. Um, a lot of these units now are powered by a turbine that bleeds some air off of the brake line to charge the batteries to keep them running uh, indefinitely. And so these fields are all clear. You can, if you know where to look in, inside of the packet, you can get the data. Um, they are validated, though, by uh, a set of 18 check bits using BCH error correction. And I'll explain a bit about that in a moment. But here's a first attempt at decoding this. I just recorded an audio sample uh, off of a you know, scanner or one of my HTs or something. And this is Audacity, which everyone who works in uh, STRs has seen in many demonstrations. Since this is 1200 baud, if you record at 48 kilohertz sampling rate, every symbol is 40 cycles or 40 uh, samples. So if you get lost kind of going through this, looking for whether it's one cycle or one and a half, you can just measure 40 samples and kind of figure out where you are. So I, I put a comment track down at the bottom there, or two actually, and went through the whole thing and just typed 0101 and then. Um, correlated that to what I knew those fields were. Uh, what, I knew the unit ID for this unit. The unit IDs are all printed on the side of the EOT, so if you can see it, you can get the unit ID from there. And I discovered that it was 
um, all of the multi-bit uh, fields are little endians, so you have to reverse them to before you convert them to uh, decimal. But this is unit uh, 10603, and the pressure was 66. <clears throat> All right, the BCH code. If you just want to know uh, what the data you know, contains, then you can just look at these fields. If you want to actually validate the packet, you need the BCH code. So BCH code is a, a type of CRC, forward error correction. Um, how to actually calculate the generator polynomials is another lecture that I'm not qualified to give, but I'll give you an example of how to calculate the check bits if you know the generator polynomial, and this is similar to any CRC calculation. So this, this example is, is the simplest one that you can use, uh, the 7-4 code, and what that means is that there are seven bits in a code word and four of those are actual information. And the other three are the, the checksum. And typically you would take the information in the checksum and concatenate them to come up with a check word or a code word. So here's an example of calculating that. Uh, the first step is to take the, um, the order of the, poly, the generator polynomial, which is third order. Uh, the generator polynomial is 1011 in binary form. And then you pad your information with the same number of zeros as the, as the order of the polynomial, which ends up being the number of bits in the polynomial minus one. Um, and then you just mod that. So we don't care what the quotient is, we just care about the remainder. And the remainder uh, is the check, are the check bits, is the check bits. So in this case, we take 011, because we know it's three bits, and concatenate that with 1010, and that's our code word. So there are 127 possible seven-bit um, binary numbers, but only 16 of them are uh, valid, valid code words. And you'll notice here that any code word, any valid code word, um, if you rotate it, that's also a valid code word. So that's the sort of cyclic nature of this. Um, I've done a sort of linear list of valid code words and, and not valid code words, which is a gross oversimplification because what you're really after is the Hamming distance, which is the, the number of bits that you would have to change in an invalid code word to get to a valid code word. And for, that, for this uh, code, it's, it's very small. Um, you can only correct one error in this code because the Hamming distance is like three or um, a minimum of three. But in the... Um, uh, BCH code for the EOT packets, we have a lot more check bits, so we can correct a lot more errors. However, uh, there are two ways to validate a packet. One is to actually do the error correction, and the other one is to just recalculate the, what you know the check bits should be and make sure they're the same. So in a non-critical application like this one certainly is, that's a much easier way to do it. So you basically just you know, use your generator polynomial, mod it with the data, and see if the bits that you received are the same as the bits you calculated. At least that's what I assumed would be the case. Um, it turns out it's not quite the case for this, so the BCH code in, in the EOT packet is a 6345 type, so there are 45 bits of information, and then 18 bits of uh, check bits. And this, took, this probably took the longest time of any of this to uh, figure out. Um, they actually first reversed the order of the whole data block, and then they calculate the, um, then they calculate the uh, uh, check bits here, the VCH check bits. And then for some reason, they XOR that with an 18-bit uh, string. Uh, it, I think there's probably some technical reason for that. I don't have the sense it's a security reason, but because obviously you could just, if you know the right answer, you could just XOR it with what you have and get the key. So I, I don't think it's a security um, thing, and maybe one of you has some, an idea about why they do that. Um, but anyway, then they take the encrypted, I hesitate to use that word, but um, encrypted check bits and concatenate those with the original packet, not the reversed packet. So this took a lot of futzing around to figure out but once I got it, I could reliably re recreate the check bits and compare them to validate my packets. All right, so the decoder that I put together is in two parts. The first part is um, GNU radio. And in GNU radio, I'm gonna 
uh, take the IQ data from the SDR and demodulate it to audio, and then take the audio and demodulate that to a bitstream and then send that to a ZMQ socket, and then in a separate Python script, which could be localhost or anywhere, um, I'm going to grab that ZMQ pub sub socket and um, parse out the data fields, compute the checksum, and validate the packet. So here's the whole flowchart. It's very simple. I've tried to keep everything very simple here. Um, I'm going to zoom in on this, but that's, that's the whole thing. So basically, uh, RF stuff on the top and audio stuff on the bottom. So the upper right, uh, upper left corner, I have the uh, Osmocom source there. Uh, low pass filter drops it to four kilohertz bandwidth, which is still more than we need. Um, a squelch, which I actually haven't been using, uh, and, and I'll explain why in a moment. And then uh, moving over, I have um, a resampler to get it down to 48 kilo, kilohertz audio. And that's way more than we, we need for this application, but I wanted this to also be able to read uh, a WAV file. So I just did everything at 48K so I can read a WAV file in for testing. And actually, if you um, feed a source, an audio source, uh, from the laptop microphone into this and just put a radio next to it, it will decode the packets. It's a pretty slow data rate, pretty robust format. Uh, audio sync if you want to hear it. And then this, the line that goes back across is audio at this point. Then I go into a free, frequency translating FIR filter. And what I'm doing here is shifting the, the center to a point that's um, halfway between the mark and space frequencies. So the, the zero point now, the zero hertz point, is used to be 1,500 hertz. And what that does is it makes the space frequency uh, positive and the mark frequency negative. And so the complex output that that creates goes into the quadrature demod block and in simple terms, the quadrature demod output is proportional to the frequency of the input, or the, the instantaneous frequency of the input. So if you shift the input such that you have positive and negative frequencies relative to that midpoint, it's very easy for the quadrature demod block to figure out the, whether it's a mark or a space, essentially with two samples. Um, I'm using four, but even that's more than we need. The mark frequency is um, the lower frequency, so I have to invert the logic, which is why I'm multiplying by negative one. And then uh, I'm resampling that down, oh, smoothing it, resampling it down to four uh, cycles per symbol instead of 40, so just dividing by 10. And then uh, clock recovery, binary slicer, and then the ZMQ pub socket, and, or pub sync. The output of the binary slicer is bytes. So there's a byte that represents each bit. So it effectively increases the data rate by eight. And the bytes are like 0x00 and 0x01. So they're not ASCII 0 and 1. They're actual you know, um, hex 0 and 1. Uh, just a, to quickly show you the, the steps in this graphically, this is just that same 0101 test signal that I showed you earlier in green, and then the output of the, um, uh, the quadrature demod block is blue. So you can see when the frequency is 1,200, it goes uh, down. The kind of sinusoidal signal goes down, and when it's 1,800, it goes up. And then the binary data, that's after, it's, um, after the slicing, and the logic's been inverted. So it's very clean, and um, uh, seems to be pretty reliable. I don't think you'll be able to read this, but I'm, this is up on GitHub. Uh, this is the routine that essentially t connects to the socket. And what's coming in is arbitrary chunks of ones and zeros. So it might be one byte, it might be 20 bytes. Um, if, if we have time, I can kind of show you that, what's coming through. So what I'm doing is I'm putting each of the new blocks that comes in that I read one byte at a time into a deck that has a finite length that's more than I need, more than the packet length. And then uh, every time I put a byte in, I take the whole thing, put it in a buffer, and see if my frame sync 
sequence is at the top of the buffer. And if it is, I know that it might have a packet. And so I go then into a, um, a class that parses out the data and does all the acrobatics to figure out the checksum. And if the checksum checks out, it sets a flag, and then the main function prints it, calls another function to print it to the screen, which I'll show you. This will be easier to see if it's in front of you, but, but that's the process. There may be a more efficient way to handle that, but I'm not very good at Python. So, <laughs> so this is, uh, um, but it works. It seems to work reliably. All right, so here's a field test, and I, I'm going to just, sorry. <laughs> just wanted to have audio for this. It's not important, but it makes it more dramatic. So there are two packets arriving. Uh, there's no reason to be this close to the train. You could be a mile away. In fact, I was testing this this morning in my hotel room on the other side of the strip, and I was getting packets from a train going by, no problem, inside the building. So it's, it's, um, you, can, you can receive these things pretty far away. All right, so I want to do a live demo. I have uh, loaded up here on my... Um, uh, HackRF with port pack uh, audio files that are packets, and this is tr going to transmit them. Uh, I'm using one of the hand bands, the 440 uh, 70, uh, centimeter hand band, so that we don't transmit on the actual railroad frequencies. And I can ID and all that to keep this legal. Um, so really, there are just two parts of this. I'm going to hit play on the flow graph here. And then I'm going to run, once it's up and, you know, once it gets settled here, I'm going to go over here and run this, uh, oops, uh, pyeot.py. I wrote all this stuff in Python 3 uh, because it's 2018, but of course, uh, GNU Radio is still Python 2, so you kind of have to run them separately at the moment, but hopefully in the future that will, you know, they can kind of get integrated. And um, I'm just going to play, I'm just going to loop here uh, a, a kind of demo sequence that has a number of packets in it. And I have my HT on here so you can hear the, you can hear the chirps. And we're not getting all the packets. This is a noisy environment. Oh, there we go. I put an attenuator on this and I uh, probably shouldn't have, but you can see there three different packets that are kind of flowing in there. And what, um, I, I've just picked some interesting fields to display. This isn't all of them, but I have the ID and the pressure and whether the train's moving, whether the marker light's on, that sort of thing. Um, one of the things about, another thing about, uh, I'm gonna stop this, hold on. <laughs> the other thing that, that detail that might be helpful in this is that uh, railroad cars, the couplers all have slack in them. They're, they're in gearboxes, so when the engine starts moving, the first car starts moving, and then the second car starts moving, and then you'd never be able to start a two-mile train if it were all rigid. So this helps the engineer, this uh, motion marker helps the engineer know when the back of the train has actually started moving. And some of the more advanced EOTs use discretionary data to actually tell the direction, too. That's the thing, they're, they're kind of you know, the standard came out and then different companies kind of used different discretionary fields to do different things. I'm going to go back to PowerPoint here. So security. I haven't talked much about the, the HOT part of this. Uh, the standard has two commands for the HOT. One is a status request. The EOT broadcasts its... Um, uh, data every minute, give or take 10 seconds, but if the HOT hasn't heard from it for a while, it can request status. Uh, the other command is that emergency braking command. The, um, there, the security that's built into this is sort of uh, to prevent a rogue HOT from initiating an emergency stop for an EOT. And so there's an arming sequence where you press a button on the EOT, and then you press a button on the HOT, and then it acknowledges, and then that HOT is allowed to send the emergency signal. The problem, though, is that um, there's no way for the EOT to know if that actually came from the HOT. So 40 years ago, that wasn't really a big 
concern, but now it is. And this is something, this is not, I didn't discover this. This is known about in the industry for years. Um, there's a paper from 2005 from the uh, Joint Rail Conference in um, Pueblo where Paul and Stephen Craven, who I seem to be related, uh, wrote about the vulnerability of spoofing this signal and uh, provided some recommendations for a key exchange. As far as I know, that's never been done. So the code that I'm putting up on um, GitHub does not deal with the HOT at all. It decodes the EOT and that's it. It doesn't generate packets for either and it doesn't even decode the HOT. It's not especially interesting to look at the HOT. It rarely broadcasts and the chances of catching that emergency packet are very small. And for that reason, a replay attack isn't really a big concern uh, because it's such a rare event. All right, so the other, um, the other protocol that I want to uh, talk about, and we're right at 4.30, so that's good, I, halfway there. Give me just a second here. Um, is the automatic equipment identification system, AEI system. And this is an RFID system that's used for identifying equipment as it passes a, a reader, essentially. So back in the 60s, the rail industry started looking for a way to do automatic equipment identification. And what they came up with initially was one of the first barcodes. This is a system called CarTrack. Oh, I'm sorry, let me put this, make it big here so you can see it. Uh, come on, all right. All right, car track, which is a, a barcode, a colored barcode that went on the side of the cars. And um, they worked really well until they got dirty, and then they didn't work at all. So the whole thing, the whole mess was abandoned in 1977. And then through the 80s, they tried to come up with another way to do this and, and settled on RFID. So by 1994, uh, 1991, this, the mandate went out, and by 1994, every rail car engine in the US had an AEI tag on it. This is an actual AEI tag here. So it's a you know, RFID tag. Um, some of these slides I made for a less technical crowd, so um, I'll go through them quickly, but essentially in any, any RFID system you have a reader and a tag, and the tag is usually a passive device. Sometimes they're battery assisted, but essentially the idea is that the reader sends out RF power, and that power is the tag, which then spits back some data. And um, there are a couple of different, broadly a couple of different types of RFID. The lower frequency ones where antennas would be impractical, they're very long, um, are inductively coupled. So most of the access, like door access systems and things of that nature, you have a coil in the tag and you have a coil in the reader and you get them close together and they couple like a transformer. At higher frequencies, it's practical to have antennas that are you know, reasonable relative to the size of a reader. And so you can do some long range stuff where you actually send the power out pretty far and, and get it back. So a common application is tolling, for example, you know, high speed tolling. The system that we're gonna look at is in the 900 megahertz ISM band. And um, what else do I have here? Yeah, long range, um, et cetera. There are two standards that apply to AEI. One is this ISO 10374, which is an old, um, you know, antiquated by any other standard than the outside of the rail industry, um, air interface protocol. The air, air interface protocol essentially defines the um, exchange, the way the data is exchanged, and the format of the, of the ID, the data that comes back. In this case, it's 128 bits. And so then whatever your application is, you decide what those 128 bits mean. And so the AARS 918, AARS, the, American, the Association of American Railroads, S918 protocol or standard then defines what those 128 bits mean and where the tag should go on the car and things of that nature. Um, I think that's been replaced now by S9203 and then, and then by S6009, uh, but I don't have copies of these, so I don't know for sure. Um, S918 is pretty old, but nothing's changed, you know, in this. 
Uh, here are the fields that the tag contains. There's the type of equipment, whether it's an engine or a car, or there are others, trailers, you know, some other special types of equipment. The um, reporting mark, which is a four letter uh, identifier that tells you who owns it. So if it's UP, it would just be UP, Union Pacific. Um, if it's a company that isn't an actual railroad, but so up to four letters, um, isn't an actual railroad, but um, leases equipment, then it would be, there'd be an X at the end. So like GATX is not a, a common carrier, but they own equipment. So there are um, reporting marks assigned to anyone who owns rail cars. And then you have the, uh, uh, which side you're looking at. There's two tags on each car, and that's related to the end that has the handbrake, looking from the end that has the handbrake. Uh, the length of the vehicle, the car or engine, uh, how many axles it has, what type of bearings it has. They're all roller bearings now, but, but back in the early 90s, there were still some friction bearings. And then there are a number of additional equipment dependence parameters, like engines have slightly different data than cars, and then there are actually some there's provisions in there for active tags that would tell you things like how much fuel is left in the engine or, or things like that. Um, as far as I know, those don't exist, but they are in the standard. So the, def the performance depends on uh, basically two things, the um, effective radiated power of the reader and the speed of the train. So you get more ERP by narrowing the, um, uh, the polar pattern of the antenna, but then you have less time to read as the train goes by within that window. Now typically I'm seeing you know, dozens of tag reads for, a tr for each tag as it goes by, so it's pretty fast. Um, the maximum I was able to get was uh, about 20 feet for a 70 mile an hour Amtrak train. And um, that was at 32 watts ERP, using a, a two watt radio, but a very high gain antenna. Uh, the ERP calculation, here's an example. If you have a two watt transmitter and a nine dBi antenna, it's two watts times 10 to the nine over 10. So you end up with about 16 watts ERP. So if you go up to um, uh, 11 dBi antenna or 12 dBi antenna, you'll double that again. There are a couple of different readers on the market. Um, and, and to be clear, I'm not doing this in um, GNU radio. That's possible, but it, it exceeds my skill level. So um, I went for a commercial reader that, on eBay, essentially. So um, there are two types you can get. One is a kind of low power, one watt, and the other is a high power, two watts. And the one watt is a part 15 device, which means anyone can use it without a license. But for a railroad application, you have to be very close to the train, and it's unlikely that you could get that close and not be trespassing. So the low power option is kind of off the table. Um, the high power reader, you can run at two watts and attach any antenna you want. And for a commercial application, you would get a, a Part 90 license from the FCC, which is a site-specific license. Uh, I did my experiments using my amateur radio license privileges. So um, amateurs can operate up to 1,500 watts in, in the 900 hertz band. I operated two, so not a big deal. And I found that I could ID by toggling the radio um, using Morse code and toggling the radio in the device to, to keep it all legal. So the, the one that I bought on eBay was a Sirit ID5100. Sirit was um, a really great company and then 3M bought them and scuttled the whole thing. But this product was, it's about this big, and it was designed for tolling and like parking garage access applications. It happens to support ISO 10374, although you have to find somebody who can install that key for you. I found a former Siren employee who was able to do it. And um, uh, you can use it, uh, it has a built-in antenna, or you can use an external antenna. I used a, a 9dBi Yagi. Uh, for my experiments because it's less uh, obvious than this big panel thing. And um, uh, it's a pretty robust device. It runs Linux internally and you can 
upload over TCP uh, Python or JavaScript scripts, and it has internal storage, so you can have it do logging on its own. All it needs is power. It has GPIO lines. It has a serial port. Most of the communication is over Ethernet. So it's a really cool device. I've never seen another one on eBay since I bought this one, so um, you may have trouble finding one. But um, uh, what I got out of it is 128 bits. So then I took the AAR standard, which I easily found in a Google search, and took those fields and wrote Python to parse them out so I could make it readable. So this, this was actually the first test, which went unusually well, um, of that software that does the parsing. So this is Amtrak, about 70 miles an hour. And you can see the tag data populating as the cars go by. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's very kind, thanks. Um, so the field's going across. We have a timestamp uh, down to millisecond. And then you know, uh, Amtrak, the car number or engine number, whether it's a car or an engine or locomotive. And then what side we're looking at. So you can tell which way the train's going from the side because the engine's either facing left or right. And then um, the length of each car, how many axles it has, et cetera. So I wanted to, I, I mentioned earlier that my work is in noise control and I do rail noise occasionally. So the, um, the pretense that I used to get information on this, to do this project was that I wanted to try to correlate noise data with AEI tag, you know, the equipment that creates the noise. And then it turned out to be a viable research project, so I went ahead and did it. So um, I wanted to do logging long term. So I found, some, I found a property owner who was cool with it that was very close to the tracks, but not on the railroad property. And uh, to do this, you really want to do triggering because you don't want to just spew 32 watts of square wave all the time. Um, in any environment, especially in the ISM band. So uh, the railroads do this with wheel flange detectors. Uh, I couldn't do that, obviously. I couldn't touch the track, so I used ground vibration. Uh, this is a seismic geophone. Geophone's like a microphone that you bury, and it outputs essentially audio, but there's nothing above a couple hundred hertz. And we use these for measuring propagation of vibration through the ground. But I put this one as close as I could get it to the tracks. And I wanted to make sure that the ground wave that precedes the train would arrive soon enough to get the radio turned on to get the first tag. So this was a, this is a wave file down here. And essentially, I have about one second of warning at 70 miles an hour, so, which is plenty of time. So um, that was the kind of proof of concept. This is a little circuit I built to do the actual triggering. So there's a, it's just a dual op amp. On the left side's a differential amplifier. The output of the thing's differential. About 70, um, what was it specifically? 73 dB of gain, which is arbitrary. Um, this side is just a comparator. And then I have a, uh, a threshold control that, that's the other side of the comparator. So I can basically um, set this up with an LED and just turn up the threshold until it stopped blinking under normal conditions. And then when the train goes by, uh, it'll you know, trigger. So this goes into a GPO, GPIO line on the reader. And I have a Python script running on the reader that looks at that and then toggles the power of the radio, either puts it from standby into active mode and, and vice versa. So here's a, a video of that. Um, the little circuits down in the left corner there. I don't know if this is playing. Whoops. I really want to play this. Let's see. I guess it is playing. Okay. So the circuit's down in the left corner there. You'll see the lights start to blink. And then uh, the top terminal window, which you probably can't read, says that the, it went into active mode. And then it's reading the tags. And then after uh, the ground vibration drops below the threshold on the comparator, the script drops it back into passive mode. And if it goes into active mode, when a truck goes by, it doesn't really matter. You're not going to lose any data and, or, or cause a significant amount of RF pollution. So, so that worked pretty well. So I um, 
put this box out there with the reader in the box. Uh, sorry, you can't see that. Uh, with the reader in the box, and then I have an Ethernet hub and um, a cellular modem and a Raspberry Pi and a sound level meter. And um, essentially, this is about 30 miles from my office, so I could, I'd, I just had the Raspberry Pi do a reverse tunnel out to a DigitalOcean droplet, and then I could get to it from there and experiment with it remotely. It also, um, it's also the remote uh, control of the radio, which is important for uh, amateur privileges. And uh, the reader is just logging all of the data, so I logged for about five weeks. This is the uh, Yagi. It's on an old shed about 15 feet from the rail. And then there's also a, a microphone on a stand that's um, logging, the sound level meter's logging the data from that. So th this is what comes out of the reader, the raw tag data. So we have 128-bit uh, tag IDs. And then um, I can translate into, into something like this. So this is a single train. And you see a locomotive at the top and then all the stats. And then the EOT actually has its own AEI tag. So at the bottom, you see the EOT tag. With, that's one of the possible devices. So we have locomotive, car, 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 EOT. And since I know the length of the train, and I know the timestamps, I can actually calculate the speed also. So I've got the length of the train, um, the speed, and then I can, in most cases, can surmise the direction from the direction the engine's pointing. Then I can take that and turn it into a list of trains. So this is a list of trains where uh, I have a timestamp and then the number of engines plus the number of cars, which direction it was going, how long it was, um, how many axles, and how fast it was going. And you see only a few of them have EOTs. The EOT only has a tag on one side. So if it's going the other way, you won't catch it. Uh, the railroads have readers on both sides of the track. So they can, for redundancy, but they can also catch if there's a missing tag or whatever. So um, I didn't catch all the EOTs, but you'll see there's one train in here that's like 8,000 feet long. So that's a very long train. And this is in New England. We don't get a lot of 8,000 foot trains. So that was an exception. All right, so here's a, uh, an automatic correlation of sound data down on the bottom. So these are one minute LEQs or one minute average levels. And then uh, each blue dot is a train from the AEI data. So you see they line up very well. Every time there's a spike in uh, sound pressure level, there's a train. And we can do some interesting things like um, look at eastbound Amtrak trains versus westbound. And you see the, uh, the westbound ones are much louder. And that's because there are trees over here and not over here from the microphone position. And you can look at anomalies like that one at the end of the red trace is lower than the others. There was a slow order or something, so it was going slower than usual. So a lot of interesting data from this. And my conclusion was that this is pretty useful for uh, noise surveys when you need to know um, what the equipment is. You know, instead of having an intern with a clipboard writing down everything, you can log the stuff uh, automatically, but the problem is that it uses a lot of power, which is, you know, you can overcome that, but also you need a site license. It's not a license for the thing, it's a license for the thing at the place it's going to go. So for a short term project, it doesn't make any sense. But it does work. So it was, it was an interesting, turned into an interesting um, research project that started as just, you know, trying to see if I could do it. Uh, security, the, uh, there's nothing on these tags that isn't also painted on the side of the car. You know, the number and the owner and all that stuff. So you could conceivably do this with machine vision um, or an observer or videotaping it and writing stuff down. Um, so I don't really think that there's any meaningful security concern with this. The, um, there's no indication of the type or presence of the load in the car. So we don't know if it's anything's in it at all or what it might be. Uh, but there is a sensitivity in the industry to private readers, which I think is just kind of a knee-jerk reaction. And a lot of that, that really flamed up about five years ago when a, this company called Clipper Data um, bought 30 readers and 
rented people's backyards along rail lines with in internet connections, and they were going to aggregate the data and sell it back to the shippers or something, some sort of commodities um, thing. And BNSF found a couple of the readers and flipped out. And the, the end of the story was that um, Clipper Data had only applied for an FCC license, or been granted an FCC license for one of the 30, uh, which I think was just a misunderstanding, but they got fined a quarter million dollars by the FCC for the other 29. So the whole project got put to rest. Uh, but this was actually what got me thinking that maybe I could do this, because <laughs> I, I always assumed it was, you know, it was kind of a, a proprietary thing that the railroads had a, you know, had locked down, but there are actually very few things like that I've learned in the last three years. Um, uh, and then finally, if you're going to try this, uh, t make sure you have a license of some sort, whether it's a commercial license for this application or an amateur license with privileges. Actually, any amateur license has privileges in this, in this band. And make sure you're not on railroad property. That's really important for any of the stuff I'm showing you today. Railroads do not like trespassers, and they will prosecute. Um, so uh, I'm, not a, I'm not an attorney, certainly. Um, to do any of this at your own risk, but I recommend those two, those as a starting point, or starting points for any kind of experimentation. And that's about it. Here are some resources. The, uh, the PyEOT software that I demoed is up on GitHub. And um, I've listed here a couple of Windows applications that do railroad uh, telemetry decoding. One is SoftEOT, which I mentioned earlier, which takes in an audio signal. So you have to have a radio external to the computer and decodes EOTs. The other one that's interesting is ATCS Monitor. ATCS is one of those traffic control systems. And things like signals and switches and other devices um, spit out data with their status, and they're also controlled with um, the RF link. And there are people all over the place that monitor these things, and, and the data get aggregated. It's sort of like the ADSB stuff for planes. And um, uh, you can use ATSC monitor, sorry, ATCS monitor to look at a panel. For example, in Las Vegas, you can look at 100 miles north of here and see this aspect of every signal. You know, whether it's red or green, and where which blocks of track are occupied. So it makes it very easy to find trains. But we don't have this in New England, so I've never really um, done much work with it. But it's pretty cool. And then uh, if you want to read more about BCH code, <laughs> um, Wikipedia page is a good starting point. There are also a couple of good articles that you'll find you know, right at the top of a Google search. It's pretty interesting stuff. And that's all I've got. So thanks for your kind attention. I appreciate it. I think there's a couple minutes if there are any questions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the the question is if you I think if you stand behind an existing reader can you read the tag data? And the answer is not, I'm not sure. I tried that in my office a little bit, but there aren't any readers that I have access to you know, that are out there. So I would have to set up one, and then and I just haven't done that exercise. But it is something that I played around with a little bit, because that obviously is a much less intrusive way to do this. Yeah. Uh, Crossing signals generally use track circuits, so essentially the the train shunts the rails, and then there's um, the fancy ones use like TDR to figure out the distance and the velocity of the train. So a faster train, the gates will go down sooner. As far as I know, that stuff uh, doesn't have a wireless component to it. Um, if it's anything, it would be that ATCS data, but I haven't really dug into that. Oh, yeah, that's a, an important point. So this is all, really only, a, the EOT stuff is only freight. So uh, passenger trains have 
connect, electrical connections all the way through so they don't need it. Um, as far as light rail, that would be really specific to the, if there's no interchange service with other railroads, then there's no requirement to comply with the, with the uh, AEI tagging, for example. I know that some of the light rail systems have their own RFID systems for tracking. Whether they're compatible, I don't know. I haven't uh, played with that. All right, well, th oh, yeah. Oh, um, I would be happy to. Uh, you'd need a reader to, for it to make any sense. So it's a little, there's a higher barrier to entry. But, um, but yeah, I, I can put that up there too. Great. Well, thanks very much.